Uh, Ukraine is asked, are you ready for the nuclear end of the world? And Ukrainian answers, yes, I am ready and I have plans for six months afterwards. <laughs> Now, Andrei was in Kiev as the war in Ukraine began, but got word that he was on a Kremlin hit list of prominent Ukrainians uh, who could be either killed or jailed. Uh, Andrei's got a new book out. It's called Diary of an Invasion, which is detailing his own thoughts and experiences of the war, alongside uh, insights into life for Ukrainians who continue to be defiant in the face of Vladimir Putin's aggress aggression towards their country. Uh, Andrei, welcome to the program. Thank you. Now, tell me, tell me about the book. What, what was kind of your, your main purpose in writing this? Well, actually, I write diaries from the age of 15, but I never thought of publishing them. And the first time I published the diary in 19, uh, 2014, after uh, Euromaidan, uh, and these were the real sort of short entries uh, day after day. Uh, but uh, since then, I was writing sometimes longer texts, sometimes no entries for this or that day. Mm. And uh, for this book, actually, I used the entries and the text that I started uh, writing from December last year till uh, mid-July. And I thought it was very important to explain uh, not only what is happening in Ukraine, but mm. the history of relationship between Russia and Ukraine, mm. the difference in mentality between Russians and Ukrainians, and actually about the fact that Ukraine has its own history. And, it's not part of Russian history. And, and what point in that process did you become aware of the possibility that this might be something that you would publish in the long run? Actually, I was asked to to collect my text by my mm. uh, English publisher, by Christopher Mucklehaus, uh, Mountain Leopard Press. Uh, so I, I became more disciplined when, <laughs> when yeah, we sure. agreed that we will publish this. And you talk about that differences between uh, Ukrainian and Russian mentality. Obviously, we've all been learning in this country a, a lot more about the geography and the history, sadly, you know, over the course of this <clears> year. <throat> If you could characterize that, that kind of uh, mental difference in, in one way, what would it be? Well, first of all, I mean, I'm ethnic Russian. Mm. So one might think that I have Russian mentality. In fact, actually, I have typical Ukrainian mentality, which is based on the individualism. I mean, uh, Ukrainians never had a tsar or king or royal family. They were free until 1654 for more than 100 years. They were electing their leaders who were called hetmans, and hetmans never had the same power as tsars. So, I mean, Russians were always uh, loyal to the monarchy. I mean, they loved their tsars. When they were unhappy with the tsar, they would kill him and love the next one. So Russians are representative of collective mentality. Mm. So you have actually people who, uh, on one side, who prefer freedom to stability, I mean Ukrainians, and people who prefer stability to freedom, uh, Russian. So this is the, the main uh, difference. But, I mean, the mm. best proof of Ukrainian individualism is the fact that we have more than 400 political parties registered in the Ukrainian Ministry of Justice. And in Russia, just like in the Soviet Union, it's one party system. It's Putin's party, United Russia, which you have to be a member of if you want to serve the state. And what, what um, you know, in terms of the way that the war has gone, particularly this year, you know, eight months on uh, from the invasion, how... You know, how does are you surprised at how the situation and how the war is progressing? Well, I was surprised in the beginning. First of all, I was shocked. We were with my wife uh, in Kiev, actually, on mm. the early morning to uh, on 24th of February. And I was woken up at five o'clock in the morning by explosions outside our house, which, I mean, the explosions took place like seven kilometers or five kilometers away from us, but they were huge. And uh, I was shocked. I was paralyzed on the second day of the war. We left Kiev for the village and then... Uh, we went to the Western Ukraine where our children were on holiday with their friends and then we picked them up and moved even more further. But uh, first of all, of course, I mean, when I realized the resistance of Ukrainians and actually more than 400,000 men just went to the front lines uh, voluntarily because these were the Donbass war veterans who knew that the yeah. war would come again, that the escalation is inevitable. And since then, actually, I, I, I'm not amazed anymore because I understand what Ukrainians are fighting for because I mean, they, they want Ukraine to, become, to, to remain independent and free. With all its problems, I mean, the life was there, mm. uh, wonderful. And, uh, and, and uh, now I, I'm not surprised anymore, but I have explanation because, I mean, Ukrainians are determined to fight back and to liberate their country. I mean, we, we are paying 
huge mm. costs, of course. I mean, lots of Ukrainian soldiers, officers, and civilians are killed. But, I mean, Putin came uh, first uh, with their, his army to Ukraine to defend uh, Russian speakers, as he said, and the first victims of this war were Russian, Russian speakers, speakers of Mariupol, yeah. Akhtir, Kasumi, Chernigiv, south of Ukraine. Mm. I mean, if we if we cast our minds back eight months, there was certainly complacency in the West and, you know, certainly in the UK. I think it, complacency to the point of wishful thinking about what this military build-up represented. Was that something that was, was shared in Ukraine or were people more realistic about the possibility I of what would happen next? More people were more realistic. I mean, but even uh, me, I mean, I was thinking that the escalation will take place in Donbass. I could never imagine Kyiv, Lviv and other big cities being bombed mm. and actually civilian infrastructure destroyed. And, uh, but of course, I mean, every evening uh, Zelensky would go on TV saying that there will be no war, no escalation. It's just a blackmail. And I mean, the more he <laughs> repeated this, I mean, the less I trusted yeah. his words. I mean, one of the things that's come out is, is the, the character of the Ukrainian people. And, and I think people in this country have been touched and moved by that. You know, in terms of, uh, you know, individual examples that, that are there in the, in the diaries, you know, acts of uh, defiance and, and bravery, which ones have stood out for you? Well, there are I mean, hundreds and hundreds. I mean, uh, but I mean, a, a soldier in uh, Kherson region actually blew up uh, the bridge in front of the Russian army together with himself. I mean, he died, but he stopped mm. them for a couple of hours or a couple of days. And uh, we had lots of cases like this, and they will become probably films and books, etc. But what I was amazed, first of all, the solidarity of the uh, civilians who were helping other refugees. Because, I mean, we became first displaced persons, and we were helped on the way, and we were given shelter in the Carpathian Mountains when we got stuck in the frost in February in the night was like minus five in the mountains and the traffic jam was 70 kilometers long and a young man just took us to unfinished uh, hotel and we were staying there with other families uh, of people fleeing from all regions in the south and in the east of the country. I mean, you know, when people talk about Putin, there is this, obviously, this contempt for his aggressions and this antipathy towards him. But one thing that a lot of people would have given him credit for over the years, certainly in this country, is being a smart guy, being across the brief. But it does seem, in terms of how the Russian forces would be greeted, that he's made a huge miscalculation. Has he? And if he did, how did it get to the point where he was so poorly briefed? I think, actually, uh, people were telling him what he wanted to hear. I mean, all the uh, secretary generals. And, of course, I think thanks to Russian corruption also, uh, there was not so much infiltration by Russian secret services of Ukrainian politicians. There were spies. There were people who escaped. The people who are arrested now for being... ...and having actually Russian passports in their pockets. But, uh, in, in fact, actually, he, he was sure that people will welcome Russian troops. That's why probably the first... Uh, Violence was so incredible in the uh, Kyiv region, in Bucha, Gostom, Lirpeny, when actually Russian soldiers were just shooting down uh, the, the civilians. And one of the persons who was killed in front of his house was the translator from ancient Greek, Alexander Kislyuk, who translated Aristoteles into Ukrainian. I, I can imagine, actually, he just walked out of his house in Bucha and asked them what are they doing there, and they mm. shot him dead. So, I mean, this... I mean, this... Being unprepared, uh, probably it was more shock for the soldiers and for the R Russian officers than for Putin. For Putin, it was a shock later when he started actually taking revenge against his generals and his uh, advisors. I mean, as you talk about, even in the short time we've been talking about the scale of human sacrifice and and, and the the bloodshed. Uh, when you look at you know the UK, the the big blocks essentially, the EU, NATO. They have assisted. Do you feel that they're even now? That are they doing enough? I think actually Britain and the States are doing a lot. And uh, mm. I, I'm very happy because, I mean, I'm connected. My wife is English. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we are, we, we, we are residents in Ukraine, but I was always following the politics in, in the UK. But, I mean, I was very disappointed in the beginning with Germany because, I mean, Germany, Olaf Scholz mm. was repeating that we are not going to supply you with weapons or with heavy weapons, etc. And only slowly, recently, they started actually sending some, uh, but also not huge quantities of the, the weapon, like two cannons or three missile system or the anti-aircraft systems to Ukraine. So, I mean, now we, we are getting help, but this help, of course, is not enough for two 
uh, 2,000 kilometers of front line. I mean, we, we heard a lot, you know, certainly from the Boris Johnson administration about the popularity that he has in Ukraine. And, and given that he was a prime minister fighting for his own political survival, we never knew, you know, how much of a big of a pinch of salt to take that with. Is his popularity in the Ukraine a, re a real thing? I think he is number one foreign politician uh, in Ukraine mm. until today because, I mean, because he visited Ukraine uh, so many times and it, it doesn't matter that it was maybe done for political reasons inside mm. the UK, but it was perceived very positively by Ukrainians. And, of course, Ukrainians appreciate any visit by any sort of high-ranked politician from Europe. Now, we were talking just before the trail there about Putin. I mean, he's been on uh, Russia's uh, nuclear forces have been on strategic exercises this week. How, how fearful or how realistic is the chance of that kind of ex escalation, maybe not actual outright nuclear weapons, but what, what are called battlefield nuclear weapons. Do people think that's a genuine po possibility in Ukraine? Uh, I mean, people started joking about this, which is just a sign that uh, Ukrainians are not fatalists. Mm. It is possible. I think I would give 10 to 15 percent that Putin would use uh, tactical nuclear weapons because this is the last resort he can use. He used all weapons possible now against Ukraine. Mm. It didn't help him. So, but I mean, also a nuclear weapon will not help him. Uh, mm. But of course, I mean, it will be something uh, just uh, outrageous and it will influence the world, not only Ukrainian territory. Because there was, you know, that, that counteroffensive by the Ukrainian forces, which retook uh, land in the east of the country. And that seemed to surprise, well, a lot of us. I mean, maybe it didn't surprise you. But, um, but has that changed the course of the war to the point where we thought that there would have to be some, a lot of people thought that pragmatically there would need to be some sort of negotiated settlement. Is Ukraine literally winning the war now a realistic possibility? Well, for Ukraine to win the war means to liberate its territories. Mm. And six or 7,000 square kilometers have already been liberated, which is probably more than half of the territory taken by Russia. So, I mean, Ukraine is winning now, but it doesn't mean that actually that uh, when we get to the Russian-Ukrainian border, Russia will stop fighting. They will fight back. They, they are mobilizing more people. They are sending more uh, ammunition. They are buying more uh, kamikaze drones and missiles from Iran. So, I mean, this war will go on, I think, uh, definitely until next summer. So, depending mm. on the situation on the front lines during the winter and in the spring, it will be clear uh, whether actually there might be some negotiations or not. Because, I mean, what Russia wants, what Putin wants, they want actually the territory they control as their own. They announced that four regions of Ukraine belong to Russia, which means uh, it is already put into their constitution. So they will not, uh, I think, vote again and take it out of the constitution. They can be only forced to do this by the circumstances, by mm. the international pressure. I mean, you mentioned uh, Iranian, Iranian involvement, which is quite topical this week because the head of the, uh, I think it's one of the big Ukrainian football clubs, Shakhtar Donetsk, uh, spoke about his belief that you, you, uh, Iran should not be uh, in the World Cup and Ukraine should take their place. How do you feel about that sort of uh, international movement, you know, in terms of sport, art and culture? Do you think Iran should withdraw or be removed from the World Cup? I think they should be removed from them because, I mean, they are taking part in the war. I mean, this is not Ukrainian-Russian war. This is a World War mm. Three. Uh, mm. w w whatever you call it, because I mean we we fight with American uh, using American and British and French uh, and German ammunition. Mm. Uh, Russians are using uh, Belarusian territory, Belarusian missiles and tanks and Iranian drones. So it's actually on the top level, geopolitical level, this is actually a Russian uh, war against the collective West. I mean, and, and that is, you know, you mentioned there, and it is quite chilling for you to say that this is World War Three because people always said that there would never be a World War Three because that would be the end. But what we didn't sort of see is this, the, this dimension whereby it would be partly like a proxy war, essentially, yeah. where Ukraine is, uh, you know, operating with the support of uh, a lot of Western nations. You mentioned German support. I mean, how far do you think the Western nations would, would go? Like, for example, when Macron recently ruled out certain interventions, do you think it's wise with a personality like Putin to take anything off the table? Uh, well, I mean, in this uh, war, everything is possible. And, uh, I mean, he, Putin is old. I mean, he started this war in order to remain in the mm. Russian history as somebody who created, who made Russia great again. It's just like another Putin, uh, Trump, but much mm. more dangerous. And uh, uh, he failed. So, I mean, he will take revenge, uh, and he can take revenge on Poland, on Lithuania, on Germany. on I mean, the explosion of the North Stream 2 pipes underwater. I think this is also Russian revenge against 
uh, Germany because Germany decided still to help Ukraine after they promised not to deliver the weapons. So, I mean, we, we should be prepared for anything. Now you talk, I mean, obviously you're very conscious of the bravery of, of your compatriots back in Ukraine. But uh, just going back to that, when you had to leave Ukraine, I mean, how, how did that feel knowing, you know, the way that you were viewed by the Russian state and the risk posed? I mean, looking back now, well, that must have been quite a traumatic experience, having to flee uh, the country in such a short space of time. Well, I mean, I was in Ukraine three weeks ago. My family is mm. in Ukraine, mm. so I mean, I'm going, coming and going, and uh, it, it is stressful. I mean, it is very painful to think about the, the situation mm. today. But, but, but I mean, I think any Ukrainian intellectual is under threat. And when Melitopol, a town in the south of Ukraine, was occupied, the people in civil clothes were walking the streets with lists of people they wanted to detain mm. and to arrest, and they they had these lists and they have them. Uh, so, so I mean, it's just the reality you have to face. And, you know, there are, there's talk at the moment about the, the Ukrainian deputy prime minister who's talking about the need for blackouts and also saying to Ukrainian nationals overseas uh, not to return because of these attacks on energy infrastructure. I mean, as somebody, you know, who's going between Ukraine and Britain, how, how does that make you, you feel? I mean, this is really quite, feels like, you know, one of the starkest parts of the conflict. Well, this will be the most difficult winter for Ukraine, definitely, because, I mean, Russia is daily destroying infrastructure. Uh, Ukrainian cities and towns from the Soviet time have central heating systems, which means mm. that you, you heat, you destroy one station, and the whole town is frozen. And then people cannot live there. They have to become refugees. So this is what he wants to achieve. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, I understand that actually the Ukrainian government is prepared for this. And, and there are also some kind of uh, uh, works uh, of he helping works from the mm. West, like pulling the cables, electrical cables, electrical supplies from Romania, from other countries on the border. So Ukraine will be helped. But definitely, I mean, we have to face the blackouts and they will be longer and longer. I mean, now they are six hours a day in Kiev. Uh, they can become 12 hours a day. And probably in some towns and cities, maybe there will be no electricity at all. I mean, I mean, that's an interesting point to sort of reference your assertion that, that you feel like Putin's wars robbed you of your sense of humour. Is that something that you felt at the time of, of writing or is, is that a state that you kind of sort of find yourself in semi-permanently now? No, no, no. I, I think the, the humour came back. It, I mean, I, I loved always black humour. I mean, mm. in my novels, actually, you find mostly black humour. Sometimes it uh, was grey. Uh, uh, I mean, it's the second time that I lost sense of humor in the beginning of the war, but it came back thanks actually to the soldiers' humor because, I mean, the soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers are posting on Facebook in Ukraine lots of new jokes about Putin, mm. about what is happening uh, in Russia, and actually it helps me. It helps me, <laughs> helps me to smile and helps me actually also to write uh, with uh, some kind of uh, jokes, also the texts uh, which are quite dramatic. I mean, does that, you know, you're doing your you're moving between Britain and the Ukraine. I mean, just just one thing that I've got from social media and learning more about Ukraine as a country is that sense of humour in the face of adversity, something that the two cultures share? No, actually, magic and humour comes from Ukraine. Mm. Uh, it, I mean, you will not find a lot of humour in Dostoevsky or in Pushkin or in Turgen. If you will find it in Gogol's I mean, with the, work. With the British, that kind of, yeah. sort of gallows humour, as they say. Yeah, also. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I can give you a, a short example. Mm. A Ukrainian is asked, actually, they, I mean, this is a joke after the nuclear threat yeah. <laughs> appeared. Uh, Ukrainian is asked, are you ready for the nuclear end of the world? And Ukrainian answers, yes, I am ready and I have plans for six months afterwards. 